William Kumwembe with Business Time on Times Television, Keres of Skyband. It is a magazine program. We will bring you major business and economic news stories making headlines. And in the program today, UN report unveils trade hassles among Comesa member states. And banks predict doom over interest rate capping. We have these and other stories. Stay tuned if you could. Relax. Here's how to connect. One, turn on your wireless card and connect to the Skyband hotspot. Two, open your web browser and enter the login and eight-digit password exactly as it appears. Three, now you can relax and surf the internet at any of our hotspots. Skyband. Hello and welcome. A report by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development has highlighted challenges cross-border traders operating in Malawi, Tanzania and Zambia face in their day-to-day -day operations. The report, Borderline Women in Informal Cross-Border Trade in Malawi, the United Republic of Tanzania and Zambia, shows that traders, especially women, are faced with problems such as lack of trade facilitation, inadequate border infrastructure, competition and insecurity as well as immigration requirements. We have the detail in this report. The report says while the border processes are shorter and less expensive in Malawi than the average in sub-Saharan Africa, in Tanzania and Zambia, they are extremely lengthy and costly. It says such costs and delays create further disincentives for informal small-scale traders to report their transactions and choose formal trading channels. Malawi ranks on position 117 on trading across borders on the 2018 World Bank Doing Business Report, while Zambia is on position 150 and Tanzania on 180. Delays at the border result in several negative consequences for traders. They affect trading operations and diminish profits by impeding reaching potential markets or stores during opening hours and or by creating extra costs for overnight stays. For perishable goods, delays may imply that they are not fit for consumption any longer. Women face even heavier burdens due to their primary responsibilities in the household. Delays at the border force them to leave behind their family obligations for periods longer than expected. Therefore, they might be ready to pay bribes to cut delays or they may end up choosing closer but less profitable destinations, reads the report. It adds that inadequate infrastructure networks and border infrastructure, including inadequate public and private transportation systems, proper warehousing facilities, functional and sufficiently staffed border institutions and agencies heavily impact cross-border traders, especially women. It says border and market infrastructure is generally insufficient in Malawi. At the Mwami Mjinji and Songwe Kasumulu borders, for instance, no storage space is available for traders and key facilities such as toilets and inspection rooms, which carry particular importance for women, are either not present or in poor condition. Both borders close at 6 p.m., which severely limits crossing and selling opportunities for traders, while virtually no public transportation is available after sunset. Traders at Mchinji typically sell on the streets, their closest market being in Chibata. In Songwe, some market stores are found on the Tanzanian side of the border, yet local traders frequently lament the poor infrastructure and limited access to markets as being the main challenge to their businesses, Anaktkat said. According to Anaktkat field observations at selected border posts, female cross-border traders are more vulnerable to verbal and physical harassment than the male traders, and they reportedly spend longer hours clearing their goods at the border due to prolonged inspections. The report adds corruption may involve immigration officers, revenue authority officials, police, and other public service officers at the border. And Akkad says corrupt law enforcement officers often take advantage of local traders' lack of knowledge of customs procedures. Tanzanian women traders reported that a few officials charge unreceited taxes on goods below $2,000, which in principle should benefit from the STR. Other cases of bribes were reported in relation to the misinterpretation of the rules of origin or for fast declaring of goods, Africa and Ajumbo, 2012. 
Reasons for bribing also include the inability of traders to pay the correct amount of official taxes and fees. Corruption is considered normal to the point that women traders treat it as part of their daily life. Anatkat says Zambia and Malawi informally trade with each other in large quantities. They estimate that informal trade is 2.9 million US dollars per month as compared to 1.7 million US dollars in formal trade. About 20,000 to 30,000 small scale traders cross at the border on a monthly basis, 10,000 to 15,000 of whom pass through informal routes. Minister of Industry and Trade Francis Casaira was not immediately available for a comment on the report findings. Meanwhile, private sector players in Comesa member states stand to benefit from a 10 million euro kit provided by the European Union EU to support increased private sector participation in regional and global value chains. The development follows the signing of a financing agreement between the EU and COMESA. We have the whole story in this report. The agreement, which was signed in Lusaka, Zambia on Monday, is supported under the 11th European Development Fund. Comesa Secretary General Chileshe Kapiepie and the head of the EU delegation to Zambia and Comesa, Alessandro Mariani, signed for their respective organizations. The program is aimed at ensuring competitiveness and market access of small and medium enterprises and other firms in the targeted value chains are sustainably enhanced. The program will facilitate networking, access to knowledge, vital market information and support of formal business linkages between SMEs, key regional suppliers and lead firms. It will also support more formalized governance structures in the value chains and enhance capacities of SMEs and other actors in adhering to sanitary and phytosanitary measures and technical standards to comply with regional markets requirements. The program will also focus on improving the business environment for SMEs and other firms in selected value chains by complementing current national strategies developed by member states for economic transformation through industrialization. Activities will include supporting peer learning with the front runner countries sharing experiences. Kapiapia cited supply-side constraints as a major contributor to the low competitiveness and productivity of industries in the region, as well as inability of enterprises, especially women and youth-owned enterprises, to participate in regional production network. The ReCamp program will run for five years, focusing on the three priority value chains of agro-processing, horticulture and leather and leather products. Mariani said the targeted value chains were selected for having high demand in both the region and international market. Now, as the bed rages over capping of interest rates in the country, the Bankers Association of Malawi, an umbrella body for local commercial banks, has warned that the economy would crumble if commercial banks are forced by the law to cap interest rates. Bankers Association of Malawi President Paul Gouda said this after appearing before a joint parliamentary committee commissioned to scrutinize the provisions of the pended bill. Interest rate capping is a regulatory measure that prevents banks and other financial institutions from charging more than a certain level of interest. I would uh, actually re-look at that and say Will the economy survive? Because um, every economy thrives on a strong uh, and resilient banking sector. The tenets of the bill make the execution of that bill, uh, should it pass into law, very difficult. Um, and therefore, one would want to say that um, before we get to a stage where we're saying let's pass the bill, probably it's time to have another thought. In the sense then that um, as it stands, the position for banking uh, is truly challenged. And therefore questions become are we then really, really 
gonna help the populace that we want to help the Malawi population in the way that we would have hoped to help them? Probably the answer is no. And uh, certainly, I think before we move too far and too fast, I think time has come to think again. And um, we're happy that uh, the committee has seen reason to actually allow uh, more time for this kind of thought. Remember, banks are a reflection of the economy. So as we stand and, and if nothing changes, um, obviously, it then means that uh, the need for banks to actually mobilize deposits ceases. So there will be no need for banks to take deposits because the cost of that deposit is going to be higher than the price of the loan. So if, if, if banks are going to be challenged in terms of mobilizing deposits, particularly on the savings front, then the question becomes, uh, how do you lend? So this is not just going to impact the SMEs or whatever, it's going to impact everybody. And uh, that's why I'm saying we are at a time where, number one, wisdom needs to pre prevail. Number two is we need to be cautious with our pace. I think there is need for deeper consultation. There is need to wear a different thinking cap. And uh, as banks, we have said we are always and will always be supportive to initiatives that um, will help this country enjoy low interest rates, but as long as that is within the tenets of a market economy and not necessarily force it on the economy because uh, the outcome of forcing it are really things that none of us who really want interest rates want to see happening in this country. First and foremost, profit is a number. But once you talk of a number without relating it to a particular base, then uh, the statement like a super normal profit appears to make sense, but it doesn't. Because one then has to look at how much has been invested or how much capital is involved to generate that kind of revenue. And that's why there is a term called return on equity or return on capital. When you now take those numbers against the capital base of each of those banks that we're taking, saying are making super normal profits and compare the rate of return kwacha for kwacha, tambala for tambala, you then find that actually those returns kwacha for kwacha. In other words, you invest one kwacha in this bank and you invest one kwacha in another entity, for example, whether it's in telecommunications or on, you actually find that actually the return kwacha for kwacha is not far different from each other. But when we just focus on the quantum and look at the number and say, this is the profit, without matching it to the capital that is being invested to generate that, then we end up with these kind of uh, wrong conclusions and wrong statements. And I think time has come for us to begin to educate the masses around us, and we take responsibility, and we certainly will. Uh, but certainly, without matching it to capital, and then only say super normal profits, we will end up killing what we should actually be saving in this country, and it will be sad. Nobody wins if in an economy interest rates are high. Nobody wins. Actually, the biggest losers are banks. Why? Because when interest rates are so high, it then means that uh, the rate of default on those loans is also high. When we're talking of default, we're actually saying those that have bor borrowed not paying back. Now, who wants to lend money and not receive it back? 
So you end up with what we call high non-performing loans. And because of the kind of regulations that banks are exposed to, uh, very, very tight regulations, within certain time periods, then banks have got to write off those funds. And those are massive numbers that we're talking about. So banks lose. That is why when it comes to propagating a low interest rate environment in this country, we will always be in the forefront to support that. But as we support it, let's support it in such a way that we don't do it by forcing it through a law. Let's do it by taking action. Banks, government, parliament itself, the customers in Malawi as well, and so many other players, judiciary and everybody, to make sure that we're doing the right things that will help this economy and this country enjoy low interest rates. But we'll be in the forefront to make sure that we work together with everybody interested to make sure that we get there. Remember, this is Business Time on Times Television. It is a magazine program where we bring you major business and economic news stories making headlines, Kettis of Skyband, and I'm William Kumwembe. We'll be right back. How to contact support. You can call us on 099 Skyband or 021 Skyband. You can send us an email, helpdesk at skyband.mw or find our physical address on our website and come see us in person, Skyband. Welcome back. The Institute of People Management has outlined plans to double its membership base by 2020. IPM President Michael Ndafirankande, however, says lack of a law to make it mandatory for practitioners to become the association's members has had an impact on strides to grow the members' base. He was speaking on Monday when the Institute inaugurated a 120 million kwacha office building along the Catholic Institute in Blantyre. Nafiran Kande explains. One of those happiest moments in the history of the Institute, you heard me in my speech, the, the Institute was established around 1984. But this is the first time that the institute now is owning, you know, office premises. Uh, previously, we are renting. We have been all over town, but now we have our own buildings. So it's a very great occasion for us. We have spent 120 million just to buy, but obviously it's more than that because the building was in bad shape. So we had to do a few touch-ups to be in the shape that we have seen it today. We get the funding mainly from membership subscriptions um, and we also conduct workshops, annual conferences and uh, when we are lucky we get surplus and we invest that money in the money market uh, on the stock exchange and we have used that money over time you know, to, to acquire this building. Currently, we are spending our energies on the bill. As, as you know, we want the institute to exist through an act of parliament. So we have been working on the bill. Uh, we were given a go ahead by the office of the president. Now it's with the Minister of Justice. Um, Any time it will go to cabinet and eventually to parliament. Once that becomes uh, an act of parliament, we expect that the membership will grow because uh, the whole idea of having the bill is to regularize the profession. So all practitioners will become members, the membership base will increase, our uh, income base will increase, and uh, uh, yeah, the secretariat, as I mentioned in my speech, we expect to increase the headcount as well. Well, it's affecting us because, you see, we still have uh, uh, you know, people practicing who are not members and you, we have no mandate to, to force them. Uh, so it, it, it affects the operations. Currently we are at about 320 members. Of course by 2020 we are expecting the numbers to reach 520. That's without the bill. But with the bill you would expect those numbers to, you know, to grow quite significantly. Yeah, when the economy is stable, you obviously you expect more job creation. Uh, so that's uh, good news for us that the inflation rate is coming down, the interest rates are coming down. So we expect that uh, 
there will be more opportunities uh, for, for employment. We are around, as at December last year, we were 320 and that's paid up members. And as I said earlier on, we expect the number to reach 520 by 2020, yeah. But, you know, we at the, at the side of it, we have the bill. Because once we have the, assume we have the bill before 2020, those numbers will grow quite significantly. Because once that bill becomes a law, what it means is that all HR practitioners will have to become members of the institute. Currently, we're focusing on performance management and HR matrix. HR matrix basically means uh, how do you measure HR contribution. So that's the, the, the focus, the current trainers, the current trends. We're saying if you are a, 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 an HR practitioner, then we have to be able to measure our contribution to, to the business, whether you are in a parastate or whether you are in a, in a private sector. But the question, uh, the critical question is what is HR contribution? How do you measure that? That's, it's becoming very, very critical. Local tea blender Wills and Alpha on Thursday awarded three customers with one year medical insurance scheme cover each at the end of its healthy living promotion. The competition was held in a bid to create awareness on the company's product, Williams Tea, and advocate healthy living among customers. The three, Damiano Chilangwe, Grace Zico, and Patricia Mancambela, won VIP executive and Econoplan medical schemes, respectively. Maputula explains. Williams Tea has everything to do with healthy checks because uh, if you see our packet, we say Williams Tea living a healthy life, which means our customers' health is always priority for us. That is uh, either in our marketing activities or in our sales activities, even in the production itself. Um, we could say um, they have won um, medical schemes. Uh, that is the first uh, prize has uh, won a 50 million medical cover that's the annual benefit limit and the second prize is uh, 8 million medical cover and um, the third prize is 1.4 million medical cover and of course several consolation prizes of golf shirts, t-shirts and 500 grams of Williams tea. We are going to uh, liaise with the winners. Those that are in Blantyre, they can come to collect their um, prizes at our offices that is in Fargo and those that are in Lerongwe, we have our um, our friends there that will be able to hand them their prizes. But those that are in far uh, areas like Nzuzu and such, uh, we will send them by bus. And proceeding with the program, let us now have a look at how the Malayu Kwach is faring against major trading currencies on the foreign exchange market. It sounds simple hearing people, mostly women, saying, I have a nail appointment. But in that simplicity, some are making fortunes. Debbie Chira is a budding entrepreneur who has taken the uncharted route. Sharon Chira caught up with Debbie for an insight into the viability of the business. When I was young, I've always loved nails, doing my nails, you know, playing dress up. But yeah, so that's why I chose nails, pretty much. I, don't, I didn't really choose it, but I love nails. say they are a bit pricey when it comes to doing nails but it's something that everybody wants to do all the time but people just can't do it because you know it's a bit pricey most people can't really afford it so well I thought oh this is a good business idea so yeah that's when I started doing nails did like a good price and yeah it's a business now <laughs> Um, well, to get to people, it's pretty much if you're good at something, people will always come. I'm not like putting myself up there, but well, I could say that when I do nails, people, you know, they appreciate that, okay, I've gotten my nails done, I actually love them, and they come back. And the other thing is marketing. That's like your number one, you know, thing, like market your business, like whenever you can, do it.
Um, in a day, well, I charge 5,000 per session, either your hands or your feet. So in a day, approximately, I get up to five, five people. On a good day, I can even get up to 14 people. I think uh, nails, it's an art. It's an art. You just can't wake up one day and say, oh, I do nails. I've been, I studied nails and I've been doing it since 2013. And I've only had this as a business from last year, December. So I can say that it's an art that every day you practice and you achieve your goals because of the particular art that you're doing. And so I could say that nails, it's an art. And I'm keeping going because one, I love, do, I really love doing nails. I love learning about nails every single day. So it's an art and I love it. That's why I am still here and I will still be here. Well, with that story, we've also come to the end of today's edition of the program Business Time right here on Times Television. It is a magazine program where we'll bring you major business and economic news stories making headlines in the country on behalf of the entire production team. My name is William Kumwembe. But always remember, if it doesn't make money, it doesn't make sense. Bye for now.